Well, good morning, Traders Point. We are so glad that you are with us. We invite you to stand and worship this morning. Oh, your mercy never fails me. And all my days have been held in your hands. That I wake up until I lay my head. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God.
heaven, do this as an act of worship. It's just a, a sign, a posture of, of surrender and openness to Jesus. And would you just for a few moments to yourself, just begin to thank the Lord for his goodness, his faithfulness, his steadfast love that endures from generation after generation. Come on, where would you be without the faithfulness of Jesus today? We've seen what you can do, God. Now, Holy Spirit, we ask that you would awaken us again. Come on, would you sing this with me? Come on. We've seen what you can do, oh God of wonder. Your power has no end. The things you've done before.
That's our prayer today, God. The Holy Spirit, you would come awaken us, Lord Jesus. That you would revive our hearts, Lord. That God, you'd revive our city, you'd revive Indiana, you'd revive this country, Father God, you'd revive our world, Lord Jesus. Father, this morning, God, we stand and we thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. We thank you, Lord, for your power, God, your presence, God, your steadfast love, Lord Jesus, that endures across all generations, Lord. And so, Father, today, God, we just thank you. We praise you. We honor you. We worship you, Lord Jesus. We pray all these things in the powerful and mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said in faith together, amen, amen. Church, can we give it up one more time for the Lord? He's good. His love endures forever. Amen. Man, what a powerful, it's been an incredible morning, y'all. It's been phenomenal all day. I'm so excited for you guys to be part of this service. Whether you're here joining us in the room for the first time or you're joining us online, we want to give you guys a special shout out, a special welcome to all of you guys. Church, we welcome all of our first time guests, all of our VIPs in the room. So glad you choose to spend your morning with us today. And man, you picked an incredible weekend to go ahead and come and see what God's doing here at Traders Point. Uh, we're going to hear a message from our lead pastor, Aaron Brockett, as we continue on in this Deconstruct Reconstruct series. It's going to be incredible. I encourage you to grab your Bible, grab a notebook, open up that notes app. It's going to be a powerful, incredible time in God's presence. But before we do that, we have a saying around here. We say, why don't you make this place feel like home? So why don't we do that? Why don't you turn to someone that you don't know, someone behind you, next to you, in front of you, and just shake their hand and say, hey, it's so good to see you today. So glad you're sitting with me today. And then you can go ahead and take your seats. Well, we are currently about halfway through this uh, series that we've been in called Deconstruct, Reconstruct. And deconstruction, if you're unfamiliar with the term, is when somebody who used to consider themselves a Christian or a person of faith, maybe they grew up in church, and they enter into a journey of sorts to sort of take apart, reshape, or in many instances, abandon the faith altogether. Now that's kind of the backdrop of this series, but what we're doing more specifically is taking a look at just a handful of the issues that are oftentimes at the root that sort of get the gears of deconstruction moving in somebody's life. In other words, like we're confronted with some of these topics, we've got questions about it, and we don't really get compelling of enough answers and it sort of enters us into this process of deconstruction. Now, if you were with us last week, I said that um, all of us have one of two scripts, whether you realize it or not, that we are reading off of to sort of interpret um, and to live our lives by, uh, interpret and inform. So we've got like the script of God's word and then uh, this uh, very large kind of blanket term, uh, what we're just referring to as the secular script. Now, most of the time when it comes to deconstruction, the thing that gets placed on the table to deconstruct is the script of God's word. And so, you know, we can uh, pick at that and ask it questions and challenge it. And, and that's okay. Uh, the word of God is uh, big enough to handle it. And, and it's durable enough to handle our best questions. And we talked about that on week one. But here's what I'm doing specifically like last week and this weekend is I just want to put on the table the secular script and just say, when was the last time that we really got behind that? and did a little deconstructing there. Meaning like, when was the last time we really examined the logic and the promises and the claims of the secular script to see if it's really delivering what it is that it is promised? At the same time, acknowledging that we need a more compelling narrative around God's intent, his plan and his purposes than maybe what we have received throughout church historically in our past. It's a long way of saying, if you find yourself at a crossroads of crisis, don't deconstruct, reconstruct. Well, today we're gonna jump right in and uh, here's the title of today's message. What about gender dysphoria and the transgender movement? Now, if this is the first Sunday that you pick to visit Traders Point, <laughs> you picked a doozy, all right? And you might be here at one of our campuses or maybe online, you're going, man, I never ever thought that I would hear a sermon on this topic. If that's you, man, we are in the same boat because I never ever thought that I would preach a sermon on this topic. And in preparation for this, I actually went back to review my notes from Bible college on the subject. 
and strangely couldn't find them. I must have, you know, skipped that day. But this is highly relevant to all of our lives because right now, and I think most of us know this, we are living in a cultural moment where lots and lots of questions are being asked about what it means to be a man and a woman that just haven't been asked, at least at this scale in human history. Now, before you look for the nearest exit or decide that this is the exact moment you should go get an oil change, <laughs> all right, hang with me. In fact, hang with me all the way to the end um, because uh, as we navigate, and I'm just gonna acknowledge, this is a minefield of a topic, but as we navigate this, I think that you're gonna find this much more compassionate, compelling and helpful than maybe what you might have thought you would hear. I would also say this, if you're here today and you, you, know, you hear me out to the very end, and even if you disagree with me on a few things, don't be done. Now, um, you might be apprehensive and nervous as we kind of venture into these waters, and I understand why. Like, this is a really complicated and complex issue, and and, uh, you know, uh, maybe right now, like you yourself, you're, you're walking through this, or maybe somebody that you know and love is walking through it. I think this would be a good time to be reminded of 1 Peter 3, which should set the tone every time we talk about something as complex as this. 1 Peter 3, 15 says this, always be prepared to give an answer to, to everyone. Everyone would mean people that um, are living off of a different script, people that see things differently than you and me, for the reason, for the hope, that you have, but then this next part is so crucial, but do this with what? Say it out loud with me. Gentleness and respect. Now, when it comes to complex issues like this, some Christians, pastors and churches just will not address it. Others will address it, but they won't do so with gentleness and respect. The unfortunate thing is that oftentimes the people, you know, with uh, the opinions on this have some of the loudest voices and they have a tendency to be the most abrasive and divisive. And we want to be able to do both. We want to acknowledge this, but we want to do so with gentleness and respect. And I don't not only think that it's possible to do so, I think that it's absolutely necessary that we do so. If I could just share like a little bit of my heart with you today. Like I don't, well, I appreciate that. Um, I'm glad mom could join me today. All right, so, so I, just, I, I just want to share a little bit of my heart with you today. Like I don't like really want to talk about this. Like I've got, like I just need to make a point or get on my soapbox, but I know we need to talk about it. And the primary reason is because we're talking about it everywhere else. For us to be quiet on it is just awkward and weird. Not only that, but like, I, I want to, um, I want you to know my heart too, especially for those of you that are new around here. Like I genuinely, regardless of who you are, what you believe, where you come from, whether we know each other or not, like I really do want to pastor you. And pastoring is this idea of shepherding. And it comes out of this agrarian society where it's just kind of equated to like the church as a, as a flock. And, and a really good shepherd guides the flock through the valleys. And so for me just to kind of step back and say, well, I'm not going to speak to that. I'm not going to touch that. I'm in, a, I'm in a sense saying to the sheep, will you all fend for yourselves against the ideological wolves? And I love you too much to do that. Now, unfortunately... Unfortunately, there is very, very, and you all know this, there is very, very little thoughtful and compassionate dialogue going on around the subject, which is why some of you are like really nervous right now because we're not used to having conversations that are this divided in a way that's constructive. We, we live in like a politically charged environment and whenever we hear about subjects like this, we usually um, hear about it as bystanders in the culture war where people are sort of picking sides and pointing fingers and weaponizing counterpoints to make themselves look good and right and brilliant and the other side look bad and wrong and ridiculous. And so oftentimes this discussion, unfortunately, it sort of disintegrates into an us versus them mentality, which really is not a heart for people. They're just trying to make a point but I want you to know today, like I'm not up here claiming to have all the answers. I'm not up here to try to make a point. I'm not up here to slam dunk on anybody. Uh, what motivates us to talk about this is to help hurting and broken people discover the best that can be true for them because of what Jesus has done for them. And for you to be able to see, for you to be able to know how Jesus sees you. Now, I'm really glad that you guys have already clapped several times because well, I'm going to ask you to do something that I've never, ever asked you to do in the 16 years that I've been here. 
All right? I, normally, I love it when you clap and I love it when you say amen. I love it when you shout me down when I preach. Little known fact, tuck this away. When you are audible with me, I preach better and shorter. I just want you to know that, all right? So you're just like, if you're like, man, we got to get to lunch. Way to go. You know, it's like, then I'll preach faster. All right. So, so with all that said, I'm going to ask you for the next few moments together that you not clap and you not say amen, at least since I tell you to at the end. Now, the reason why is because I know that we have people right now that are walking through this very, very complicated issue. And maybe you got a teenager at home that's walking through this. You yourself are walking through this. I do not want anybody to misinterpret our clapping and amening as being against them. That's called empathy. And it's the only place for us to begin when talking about a minefield of a subject like this. We're not good enough at this as a church or as a society. And we need to begin practicing it. So I want you to have a little bit of empathy right now. And I want you to imagine being a teenager and you never felt like you were fit the typical stereotype of your biological sex. So as a result, you always felt awkward and out of place. You were born a boy, but you were never into WWF wrestling or monster trucks. You were born a girl, but you were never into American Girl doll or dress up. In fact, you would prefer to be in the backyard wrestling with your brothers on the trampoline. And as you grew into adolescence, you wondered when these feelings that you were experiencing, that you were afraid to vocalize, you wonder when they would change, but they just never did. And honestly, like, you know, you're not trying to make a political point. You just want to be at peace. Like you just want to be happy. You just want to be fulfilled. And so you stumble across some videos on TikTok where your peers or a peer is announcing that they are changing their gender or going by a different pronoun. And you see how they are celebrated and applauded and they just look so happy. And this thought crosses your mind for the first time. Well, maybe that's what I should do. Maybe that's the answer. Imagine being a parent of a teenager and they come to you one day and they tell you that they do not feel at home in the body that they're in. And, and they wanna change the name that you gave them, their appearance and their pronouns. And you're perplexed and you're confused by this. And so you go online and you read that adolescents who struggle with something called gender dysphoria, which is a term you didn't even know existed a couple of years ago, are at higher risk for suicidal thoughts and ideation. And your heart is broken as you receive counsel from online forums and even secular therapists that tell you your only option as a loving, supportive parent is to affirm and assist your child in transitioning. And that if you don't, you'll be labeled an unsupportive or abusive parent. And this phrase is yielded against you for the first time. You can either have a trans son or a dead daughter. And it cuts through you like a knife. Imagine being a grandparent and you go and pick your grandchild up from elementary school one afternoon and they tell you that they've just been given a gender wheel to help him or her decide what gender they want to be. And you have no idea how to navigate this situation. This isn't anything that you have ever been confronted with before in your life. Now, for many, if not most of you, these are not hypotheticals. This is real life situation that is in front of us. Several years ago, a prominent ministry leader among our like tribe of churches uh, who I looked up to since my college days. Uh, he was somebody that I read uh, a lot of what he had written. I'd listened to lots of his sermons and talks and I'd been mentored by him at a distance. And then I'd been, I'd been up close with him where he'd offer us prayer and wisdom and counsel. And this was about 10 years ago. I served on a board of directors with him of a church planning organization. And he shocked all of us when he announced to us that as a 60 something year old male who's getting ready to retire from the ministry, that he was going to be transitioning to become a female, which he did. And I'll never forget get it, uh, getting the call from him at my home just about five days before Christmas. And I spent about an hour with him on the phone as he just unpacked and explained his process and his journey that became very, very public and very, very painful. This issue is not a hypothetical for me. And I know it's not a hypothetical for many of you. I've already heard from so many of you this, today. This is very, very personal. Now that's empathy. The next place for us to go is I think it would be helpful for us to define some terms. I realize, uh, for better or for worse, that this message is going to live online for a really, really long time. And so I think it's important for me to timestamp it because words, terms, and definitions can change as culture changes. And so for those of you listening or watching this message from the future in your flying car or kicking it in Mars, I don't know what you're doing, 
Uh, let me just go ahead and timestamp it. These are the terms as are defined in August of 2023. Sex, historically meant male and female, typically in reference to chromosomes and internal reproductive anatomy and external genitals. When someone is born, their sex is identified by anatomy, not assigned. In the past 10 or 15 years, there's been a push to separate the two with this new term that has emerged, gender identity. Gender identity means a person's self-perception of whether they are male or female, masculine or feminine. Now, the idea is that biological sex is observed and declared by the doctor delivering the baby in the room. The doctor doesn't look at the baby and go, oh, I guess this will be a girl. No, the doctor observes it and declares and says, I'm just naming the gender that, uh, that, it, that this child is. But gender identity is this idea that gender is fluid and it's based upon a self, person's self-perception or feelings. That leads into the next term, gender fluidity. The idea that people can actually move across the genders and be non-binary, which has brought us to this place where we are confronted with a really, really important question in our culture. What does it mean to be a man and a woman? Now, ironically, the terms rely upon gender stereotypes. Now, here's what I mean. Hang with me. There is a difference between gender and the stereotypes we use to code things in our culture, male and female. So what I mean is that gender is biologically defined. You either have XY or XX chromosomes. Gender stereotypes are culturally constructed and they change in different times and cultures. Now, some of you be like, what are you talking about? Well, 100 years ago, uh, when they did gender reveal parties, which I don't think they did, right? I don't think that was the thing 100 years ago. But if they did, they would have used blue to announce a girl and pink to announce a boy. Because 100 years ago, blue was associated with masculinity and pink was associated, or uh, uh, blue was, a mas uh, was uh, identified with femininity and pink was identified with masculinity. But it changed as the culture changed. You go to the scriptures. You know, what does it mean to be a man? Well, you look at a guy like David, that's, that seems to be a pretty manly man. David was a warrior, a general, and a king. He also played the harp, wrote music, and danced half naked in front of his buddies as he praised God. So what box does he fit into? They got a woman like Deborah in the Bible. She was a warrior leader who led Israel into battle. She makes G.I. Jane look soft. What box does she fit in? Now, ironically, a few years ago, when Bruce Jenner famously sort of came out and became Caitlyn Jenner, this cover was put on a magazine. And the people that were the most upset about this image, ironically, were women's rights activists. And the reason why they were so upset is because they really felt like what this was doing was it was reducing what a woman, what it was to be a woman to long hair, makeup, and cleavage. But a woman is much more than that. And I would agree. See, that is such a minimization and misunderstanding of the divine power of God that he has put into you as a sexed person. So I bring all that, that up to kind of say this, we need a broader definition of what it means to be a male and a female because there are some men who don't like big trucks and bow hunting, but they prefer cooking and swing dancing. And there are some women who love powerlifting, ax throwing, and they would prefer a beer over a mimosa. And it doesn't mean that they're the wrong gender. It means that we've stereotyped them according to culture. A teenage boy who does not fit the description of a typical alpha needs strong, godly men to come around him and help him navigate what it means to be a godly man as God has designed him, not necessarily to match the stereotypes around what it means to be a boy because not all guys like sports, but they prefer the arts. And, and what, what if you're a girl and you would prefer to watch John Wick over Pride and Prejudice? What does that make you? It makes you awesome is what it makes you, all right? <laughs> so the next term, gender dysphoria. Gender dysphoria, a sense of mismatch between your physical sex, your body, and your psychological gender identity. And those wrestling with this feel as if there is a war raging within them a war that most of them don't want. In the BBC film, Transgender Kids, it provides this definition. At the heart of the debate about transgender children is the idea that your brain can be at war with your body. 
And I want you just to sit in that for a minute and imagine how that might feel. A painful war going on between your sex and your gender, your mind and your body. And some of you don't have to imagine that. Even if you don't wrestle with gender dysphoria, all of us can have empathy for that because we all, regardless of who you are, wrestle with a dysphoria of some kind. In fact, if there's anybody that should have empathy and compassion for those facing this, it should be Christians because we know what it's like to have a war going on between our mind and our body, what we know to be true and then what we actually do. Paul captures this so well in Romans 7. He says, for in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind. And he would go on and he would say, you know, uh, the good that I want to do, I don't do. And, uh, you know, the evil that I don't want to do, this I keep on doing. And he's like, what a wretched man that I am. He's describing this battle that's going on within him. And that's what the Christian life is. The Christian life is a war between my identity, who God declares me to be, and my activity, the things that I actually do. And this conflict that is going on as a result between the two It's because of a broken world in which we live and we cannot fix it. We need a savior. Last term, the term transgender. It's an umbrella term for many experiences of gender identity that do not align normatively with a person's sex. This is represented by a little less than 1% of the population, but the conversation affects 100% of us. Almost 10 years ago in 2014, Time Magazine uh, released this cover and they did a story uh, on those with gender dysphoria and the transgender community. And they said what was previously considered a fringe expression was about to become mainstream. They called it the transgender tipping point and they were right. And this is why we are all very well aware of this conversation and it's why so many of us, we don't exactly know how to engage in it. And this really kind of brings up uh, into question kind of the fundamental meaning of personhood. This is what's at the basis of this. What is a person? And the secular script would divide the person into mind and body. If you were here last week, I gave you that visual of dualism, if you remember that, and that we are kind of um, a disintegrated person, but the script of God's word says that we are an integrated person. So dualism would separate mind from the body Or maybe another way to look at it is a very high view of mind, very low view of body. So the social script says we must affirm, accept, and assist those who want to alter their bodies to match their minds because we have a high view of mind, low view of body. In other words, my mind or your mind tells you who you really are. And your body is an expendable biological organism that is an impediment to your happiness. Which, by the way, guys, is nothing new. That is just warmed up Gnosticism. Gnosticism is, says your body is not who you are. So where does that leave us? Well, here's what I want to do, just the remainder of our time. I just want to unpack three fundamental questions. And here they are. What does God say about my body? And what does my body say about God? Number two, what is the science currently telling us And then number three, how can I be happy? Because for so many, this isn't about winning a political debate. This is about the question of personal fulfillment. So first question, what does God say about my body? What does my body say about God? All this is spoken to in the first chapter of the Bible. God created us and placed us in the world he created on purpose for a purpose. In Genesis chapter one, verse 26, it says, then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. And then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and govern it. And then in verse 31, it says, God looked over all that he had made and he saw that it was very good. So I just want to point out a couple of observations from those verses. Number one, human beings, you and I, we are created intentionally in the image of God. So how we look is intentional and it matters. It was not by chance. Number two, we are commissioned to steward creation and multiply. So our bodies have a divine function and purpose. Number three, we were created male and female, not as social constructs, but set up by God 
to display something about God. We are imaging who God is and the glory of God here on earth in the two different sexes, equal in value, but distinct in purpose and function. We see this in chapter two of Genesis where God pulls a woman out of a man's rib and that word rib in the Hebrew is the word selah. It's mentioned some 40 times in the Old Testament and every time that it is used, uh, the predominant usage of the word selah in the Hebrew means this, sacred architecture. So it's this idea that men and women are the created and intentionally designed beams that hold together and support God's temple of humanity. Scripture says that we are the temple of God, our body. So when in Genesis 2, it says that God pulled Eve out of Adam's rib, it, it, it is saying that he pulled Eve out of the sacred architecture of God's design in Adam. She was version 2.0 which we all know is always a much, much better version. You always wait for the updated version. And now the two together radiate the image and the glory of God to the world. So a man and a woman are both pieces of God's sacred structure of creation. He knows what he's doing, which is why throughout much of history, the union of a man and a woman in marriage has served to be the beam upon which society rests. It is also why when broken homes occur, broken societies are soon to follow. So the passage says that God looked out at all of creation. He said, oh man, this is good. And then he looked at a male and a female and he said, oh, this is very good. Why does he say that? Because he didn't place his image on those other things. He placed his image on humanity. See, human beings are the crowning work of God's creation. Male and female are the extensions and the representation of God's image by design. He doesn't blur the differences, he elevates them. So God gave us our bodies and then he sets his image upon them. I love how Preston Sprinkle said it. He goes, God could have created a sexless humankind to reflect his image, but he chose to create humans as sexed beings, female and male. Now, some of you may listen to all that and you go, well, that's all fine and good, but you know, um, that's the Old Testament. And uh, you know, I was watching on TikTok and they said that you know, Jesus never talked about gender. The big problem with that statement is that he did. In Matthew chapter 19, Jesus is confronted by some religious leaders and they uh, confront him about two really, really easy topics, marriage and women's rights. And so Jesus speaks to that. And when he speaks to it, what his response to them was affirming everything we just read in Genesis chapter one. And this was in a society where same-sex attraction and cross-dressing were very, very popular in Rome. And he speaks to, to a group of people known as eunuchs. And oftentimes people will look at that and they'll say, well, you know, what Jesus said about welcoming eunuchs, that just shows that he affirmed a non-binary view of gender. But eunuchs in the ancient world were either born that way due to some sort of malfunction in chromosomes or they were forced into castration. And when Jesus speaks about eunuchs, he's talking about their identity is not found in the deformity of their body, their, their, their identity in Christ, and they are welcomed in. Every time scripture addresses gender boundaries or the crossing of gender boundaries, it is consistent. It never exalts it. In Deuteronomy 22, we could go 1 Corinthians 6, we could go 1 Corinthians 11. Some will point to Galatians 3 and say, well, you know, Paul says there is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. Well, that kind of seems as if he's just kind of doing away with the genders. And we're going to talk more about this verse next weekend. But Paul isn't eliminating categories of gender. He was removing the class system of the day. He was saying, it doesn't matter your ethnicity. It doesn't matter your socioeconomic level. It doesn't matter your gender. Your primary identity is in Christ and in Christ alone as a child of God. If there's anybody that could have empathy with feelings of dysphoria in your body, it would have been Jesus. I mean, think about it. Jesus was fully God in a human body. He was God embodied. If there was anybody who knew the limitations or felt the limitations of a physical body, it would have been him. And he has an incredible amount of compassion. 
And he is not aloof to the feelings of incongruence and dysphoria that you or somebody that you know and love may be walking through. What you are walking through, whatever it is, is not from God, but whatever it is, you can bring to God. So how do we address the tension? Well, the social script would say, we need to encourage people to take steps to align their body to their mind. But what is the science telling us? Uh, what does the science currently say? You all know this, like our society has just kind of dived in headfirst with acceptance and affirmation. And the culture is really, really quick to point out the dangers and the evils of something called conversion therapy. And I would actually say they make some pretty good points there. Here's what I want to do is I want to ask about, what about the dangers of affirmation therapy? And here's what I mean. The thinking is along these lines. If we accept somebody's new gender expression, then the hope is that their mental health will improve and that the odds of suicidal thoughts or ideation will go down. But here's the question, is that happening? Is this cultural response of affirmation really helping people? Now we need to get good answers to our questions, but maybe more importantly, we need to question some of the answers that be, we've been given from the secular script. In the UK, there's a trans activist organization and uh, they released these statistics not long ago that says among trans and non-binary people, 52% have considered suicide, 20% have attempted it. And that's tragic. Now logic would tell us that those stats should be dropping the longer we continue the same approach towards assistance and affirmation. What is startling is that it's not. When you look at countries that are more affirming than we are, and they've actually been moving in this direction for longer than we have, who are outside of our political landscape, by the way. So countries like Sweden, the UK, and the Netherlands, many of them are shutting down their clinics. Uh, Sweden, who's been doing transition surgeries for 50 years, recently announced they are shutting down all gender-related treatments to minors because they weren't seeing improved results in their patients. Uh, England just recently closed the Tavistock Clinic, which was the nation's only provider of gender surgeries and treatments because an independent national review found, quote, the current model of care was leaving young people at considerable risk of poor mental health and distress. In Amsterdam, of all places, the Center of Expertise on Gender Dysphoria put out a study that found 65 to 94% of trans teens cease to identify as trans by young adulthood. That's huge because if we are urging teens to make a decision that will affect their permanent body when the vast majority will end up phasing out of it later, that's just cruel. Dr. Paul McHugh, a psychiatrist at John Hopkins University and hospital said this, treatment should not be directed at the body as with surgery and hormones anymore. Then one treats obesity and anorexic patients with liposuction. The treatment should strive to correct the false problematic nature of the assumption. Now I wanna point out that none of these organizations would be in a Christian environment. Not one of them are found in, I mean, that's something you might hear from, uh, you know, an organization in the buckle of the Bible belt, but they are outside of the biblical worldview. And the reason why I wanna point that out is that there are some that will claim that the reason why trans people and those with gender dysphoria are so at risk for suicidal thoughts and ideation is because of the hatred of Christians. And even if that's a little true, which I'm gonna go ahead and concede, there probably is a little bit of truth to that because I've actually met some hateful Christians. Then that should rip our hearts out. But I also wanna say that can't explain all of it because none of these organizations are in the Bible Belt. Not all of these are operating in a very secular environment. They've been doing it for upwards of 50 years, but they're not seeing their patient's health, mental health improving. In other words, it's not producing the good the secular script has promised. Now, as Christians, we need to be compassionate people who lead with love, but we also lead from a place of reality as we seek the good of people who are deeply burdened, hurting, and distressed over a feeling of incongruence within their body. In Romans chapter 12, it says this, and so dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God. We oftentimes hear, give your heart to God, give your soul to God. Here it says, give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. 
Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind you will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, aka the secular script, but let God, and here's the key word, transform you into a new person. How? By changing the way you think. This is an all skate. He's inviting all of us into this. And he says, then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So the secular script says, listen to your mind and permanently alter your body. Scripture says, embrace the body God intentionally gave you and allow him to transform and renew your mind. The question that I just wanna ask, for those of you that say, well, that sounds kind of alarming, but isn't that the way that we treat every other medical issue? Just imagine with me, you've got a 100 pound teenage girl that goes to her doctor and she says, I feel like I'm overweight. And a loving, well-informed doctor who's looking out for her good would not say, well, if that's how you feel, let's put you on diet pills, liposuction and stomach binding surgery. No, a loving doctor would say, let's work to help align your mind to your body rather than matching your body to your mind. I just wanna say this, man. If you have already gone down this road and maybe you've already transitioned or you love somebody who has or you've got a teenager at home wrestling with gender dysphoria or I'm describing you and you might be sitting there in your seat right now and you're going, Aaron, you know, you've thrown lots of passages my way and lots of statistics. My head's swirling right now and I'm just trying to make sense of all this and I really don't care about American politics. And honestly, Aaron, right now, I just wanna be happy. Like that's really the thing that's motivating me. I just, I just want the war to end. I just wanna be at peace. I just wanna know if I can be loved. I just wanna know if God sees me and if God has a hope and a plan and a future for me. And if that's you, I want you to look right at me right now. The answer to that question is unequivocally yes. You can be loved and you can be received and God does see you and he does have a plan and a purpose for your life. Do you know in Acts chapter eight, the Holy Spirit comes to a guy named Philip and he tells Philip, Philip, I want you to pack an overnight bag and I want you to head out of the city of Jerusalem on a desert road, 60 miles, but he doesn't tell him why. And what the Holy Spirit is doing is he's setting up a divine encounter between Philip and a man from Ethiopia that is known as a eunuch. Now a eunuch was somebody whose genitals had been cut, crushed or pierced in order to sterilize and feminize. It was an ancient and a crude form of sex alteration surgery. And the text tells us that this guy was from the capital city of Ethiopia, which was 1,000 miles away from Jerusalem. But he makes the trek, that makes the journey to Jerusalem because he wants to visit the temple, which is where the presence of God could be found. But Acts chapter eight says he was returning, dejected and rejected. Why? Because historians would have told us that when he walked up the steps towards the temple, he would have read this sign hung by the religious leaders of the day. No lame, no disease, no blind, and no eunuchs may enter. He traveled a thousand miles pursuing God and he was turned away by the supposed people of God. And I would imagine that he questioned it. Like, man, does, does God really love me? Because some of the people that claim to represent him, they stiff-armed me, they shamed me, and they shunned me away from him. And so now he's heading back to Ethiopia and the Holy Spirit sends Philip after him. And when Philip finds him, the Ethiopian eunuch is on the side of the road and he would have had an Old Testament scroll. So he's scrolling, he's gonna read Isaiah 53, but in that same section of the scroll, he would have come across these words in Isaiah 56. And let no eunuch complain, I am only a dry tree. For this is what the Lord says, to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbath, who choose what pleases me and hold fast to my covenant, to them I will give within my temple, that would have caught his attention, and its walls a memorial. So a sign written by people turned him away. God says, I'll make you a memorial within with a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will endure forever. And so he had traveled all the way to the temple. He saw the sign. He is reminded of the scars of his cut, crushed and pierced body. And he's thinking, because of my scars, I can never enter, the, enter into the presence of God. But then he read these words in verse 53 that Philip would then explain to him. And it said this, but he, referring to Jesus, 
was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. And rejected and leaving, God loved him so much that he sent Philip after him to find him on that side of the road and say, listen, your scars do not define you, his do. All right, so you guys can clap and say amen because I know a bunch of you are wanting to do that right now. And here's just how, how, I wanna, how I just wanna conclude things right now. Whatever it is that you're experiencing, whatever it is that you're walking through, whatever scars that you are carrying, whether on your physical body or on your emotional self, like your soul, I, I just want you to know if you're sitting there thinking, man, is there a hope and a plan and a future for me? I want you to know that God declares through his Holy Spirit today, you are a child of the living God. You are sons and daughters of the King. You've been given a name. You've been given an identity. You've been given a body. You've been given a place and a purpose in his house because only Jesus gets to tell you who you are. And he says, you are so loved. You are so loved. And I want you to know right now, if you are transgender, walking through gender dysphoria, or you know somebody who is, and you love them and you care for them. I want you to know what kind of a church you've walked into today. You, are, you have walked into a church where you will never ever see a sign out front that says you're not welcome here. No, we, we will love you. We will serve you. We will honor you. We will have empathy for you. We will not shame you, shun you, judge you, marginalize you, look down upon you. We will also speak from a place of truth, compassion, grace, and mercy. Speak from a place of reality to invite you into the journey that the rest of us are on to be transformed by the renewal of our mind. And here's why. What is the more liberating, joyful place to live from? For you to live with the pressure to decide who you are or for you to claim who God died for you to be, who God declares you to be. And so you... You are not who you say you are. You are not who I say you are. You're not what others say you are or society says you are. You are who God says you are. God, I am who you say that I am. God, I declare that I am who you declare me to be. Father, we come to you right now. And I just wanna pray just a pastoral prayer right now that whatever we may be walking through, that your Holy Spirit would be felt in this room, that you would meet that person right where they are seated today and that you would pastor them just as you did to that Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter eight. Father, I pray that today they would realize that they have been fearfully and wonderfully made. They are, it is not by chance and that we live in a broken, dysfunctional world. And that's why we have things like dysphoria. That's why we have things like a battle raging within us. And so we cry out to you. We reach out to claim who you died for us to be. Meet us in this space and this place. We ask this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen, church. Would you stand to your feet? We're going to sing one last song in response. Cry your voice. Would you sing this with us? Come on.
the sum of it is. If I were to try to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. So today as we sing this, let these words encourage you, wash over you this morning. Come on, I'm chosen. We are so glad you are here today. We hope you have a great week. We'll see you back here next Sunday.